is the dance music. And uh, this is this would be totally new uh, to some of them. And I'm just thankful for choir. And on Sunday night, if you come back tonight, you'll see a group of our men and hear them uh, sing a special. And the special will be just an old hymn. Uh, and they sing it with zeal and, and sing it with joy. I'm trying to remember what we're singing tonight. Who are we singing, guys? Singing I Go? Does that sound right? Sing it here. Sing. We can't sing that one, Singing I Go. We're in trouble. <laughs> the Lord is good. I've enjoyed church today already. Enjoyed Sunday school immensely. Thank God for faithful people coming to Sunday school. <coughs> I've certainly enjoyed the singing tonight or today. I've even enjoyed the, the offering time. Amen. <laughs> it's been uh, it's been good. All right. I think it was last Sunday we had a, another a baby in the choir Amen. for the for its very first time. That was that was sweet. And uh, I imagine, Brother Ron, somebody in the family has saved the video of that. <laughs> but that was that was sweet. And uh, what a joy it is watching Sydney kind of grow up in our choir, little, little Sydney. God's good. I, I try to enjoy what's going on at the time rather than have to wait and try to remember how good it was. The Lord is so precious. I love every one of you. Yes. Even... Uh, even those of you who have avoided shaking my hand. Amen. Amen. Those of you who have, you know who you are. <laughs> Sister Karen, do something about it, okay? <laughs> the Lord is good. Amen. I'm glad that the Lord is willing. You've never met anybody as holy as God. You've never met as in anybody with as high standards of righteousness as God. And yet God condescends to his children to have fellowship with us. Amen. We have a good Lord. Amen. Now if you don't know him as your Savior, you really don't know him at all, really. But you're going to know him as your judge one day. And I hope that if you have any doubts about whether or not if you were to die right now, you'd go to heaven, I hope that you'll get that settled before you leave this room. Amen. And I promise you, you can get it settled. Uh, Jesus did not say that little children had to take a study course and become as adults to enter into the kingdom of God. He said the adults had to become as little children. And so I promise you, you can know before you leave here if you want to. Amen. And you can be saved if you want to. If you go to hell, you won't go to hell because if the Lord didn't love you. Not to you that are here today, I'm telling you, God has provided for you. You being right here today, you can leave here saved, Amen. if you will. All right, would you take your Bibles, please, and turn to the book of Matthew, first book of the New Testament. Matthew chapter 9. Looking at our text, looking at uh, my title of my message I'm just thinking about how wonderful the Lord is to reach down and save sinners send Jesus to die for sinners and then to have fellowship with you and me I'm so thrilled with what's going on in our church but, but to me it's a wonder it's a wonder that the Lord in his kindness blesses us and and works among us with patience and long suffering. Yes. Because as much as I love you folks, compared to God, you're a pretty sorry bunch. Amen. And it's a wonder that the Lord even have anything to do with us, but because of Jesus, He does. And I'm so glad. Amen. Known Him for 56 years now, as of last February, and uh, oh, what a sweet Lord we have. Now, if you don't know him as your Savior, I warn you, he is a, also a consuming fire. 
He's a righteous judge. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, I want. Amen. But he's also a gracious God, and he's provided for man's salvation. If you have Matthew, I've said all that to give you some time to find Matthew. If you can't find Matthew by now, you ought to give up. <laughs> it's the first book of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 9. Would you stand with me, please? We're just going to read four verses here. I'll read aloud, if you will, follow along silently in Matthew chapter 9, beginning at verse 10. Matthew chapter 9, verse 10 says, And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. Amen. By the way, I'm glad the Lord is a physician who makes house calls. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I'm not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Amen. Our text verse will be verse 11, where the Bible says, And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master? with publicans and sinners. Would you bow your heads and hearts with me for prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the blessings of this day. We're thankful for the time we've enjoyed together in the Sunday school hour studying your word and in the morning preaching service, singing your praises, praying, having fellowship, worshiping you, giving praise to you. And the Father now having the opportunity to sit under your word being preached. May the Holy Spirit take this book and go deep in our hearts and move in our midst. Change us. Save the lost. Strengthen and revive those of us who are saved. Do a work in this church for the glory of God and for the help of people. And we'll praise your name for what you do. In Jesus' name we ask it all. Amen. Amen. Won't you be seated please? There was a little girl who, having heard this message, preached from a, another parallel passage, said that she went home and that she'd gotten saved because that the preacher mentioned her in the message. And uh, they said, really? What did he preach on? Said, said, this man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Her name was Edith. <laughs> So she figured she could get in, amen. amen. Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? They, their questions were accusatory. They were not asking the question because they're amazed at the loving kindness of the Lord to try to reach people. They were wanting to find fault with Jesus. They actually were questioning, these Pharisees, we're actually questioning if Jesus was really that pure, why would he dirty himself by dealing with such wicked people as publicans and sinners? There must have been something wrong with it to have something like these people to be drawn to him. The truth is, is there was a, a great separation between Jesus and sinners that exceeded any whitewash separation that was practiced by the Pharisees. The Bible says of our Savior in Hebrews 7, 26, for such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Telling you Jesus was more separate from sinners in certain ways than the Pharisees could ever have imagined. There were times when Jesus preached in a hard fashion that caused everybody to leave. They caused everybody to desert him. But the fact is, Jesus spent his life on earth working with the gutter most people. 
witnessing to sinners, winning sinners to God. The message this morning is titled, Our Holy Lord and Sinners. Sinners, Jesus will receive. Sound this word of grace to all, all who the heavenly pathway lead, all who linger, all who fall. Sing it o'er and o'er again. Christ receiveth sinful men. Amen. Sing it o'er and o'er again. Christ receiveth sinful men. I'm so glad for that song Amen. that is written after the truth of the fact that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners. sinners. I want to talk to you a little bit about our holy Lord and sinners. Number one, Jesus died with sinners. That's where we got the little joke from, Jesus received the sinners and eateth with them. In our passage here, in Matthew chapter 9, verse 11, the question is asked, why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? Jesus received these sinners unto himself. I'm glad that he does. Amen. I'm glad that he received me. Amen. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou biddest me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. Amen. The songwriter of Just As I Am wrote, He doesn't require for you to become a saint before you can come. He does not require for you to get rid of all of your bad habits and start a bunch of new habits and get reformed in order for you to come. Sinners, Jesus will receive. Amen. He dined with sinners. He received them. He refreshed them from time to time as he saw their needs. You remember he fed the multitudes. Amen. I mean, unregenerate multitudes, if they followed Jesus, Jesus was concerned about them. Amen. He made sure that they did not perish by the way because of a lack of nutrition. He performed miracles and took care of them and fed them. He reasoned with them. He might have been kind of short with some of the religious, pharisaical type of sinners, like Nicodemus. You remember Nicodemus came up to him and, and almost complimented him. He said, Master, thou art certainly come from God, for no man can do the miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And Jesus didn't say, well, Nicodemus, that's a very kind thing to say. <laughs> he basically looked the man in the eye and said, Nicodemus, you need to be born again. Amen. He basically said, Nicodemus, let's get down to the issue. Man's not born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Man not born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Took Nicodemus off guard and he said, what's that about? He said, can a man enter into his mother's womb the second time and be born? And basically, Jesus said, who taught you? Where did you go to school? Art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? But then, and that must have been somewhat of a rebuke, rebuke to take somebody that was a, a religious teacher and say, where have you been studying? What have you been studying? You've been watching TV too much. Then in the next chapter, Jesus entered into a theological discussion with a woman who was shacked up with a man. She'd been married five times. The man that she had now wasn't her husband. And Jesus entered into a theological discussion with her about Jacob's well and talked with her about eternal life and all. And he spent time with her that he did not spend with some of the religious Pharisees to whom he gave harsh rebukes, saying things like, I'm sorry, you just happened to be here right on the front row. I volunteer. Okay. But saying things like, you're your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and the, when he speaks of the lie, speaking of his own, for he is a liar, the father of it, that kind of thing. He said, you serpents, your generations of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? But he reasoned with sinners and spent time with sinners. People would look at him and say, why is he spending time with sinners? He did not spend time with them 
to where he could participate in their ungodliness. You listen to me, in reaching lost people, Jesus never changed his message and his behavior to accommodate them. But if they were willing to listen to him and come to him, he'd let them come. Amen. The way to reach the lost people is not to lose your holiness. The, reason, the way to reach the lost is not for you to compromise and do the same wickedness that they do. The way to reach the lost is that when you find them and they are hungry, God has been dealing with them, and they come to you, you be ready. You be ready. You ask God for Holy Ghost wisdom Amen. for you to be able to say the thing that they need to hear Amen. at that time. Amen. Jesus said to that woman there at the well, he said, Whoso drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever shall drink of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. Amen. He took what she was thinking about and, was, and God was dealing with her about at the time and he was able to use it to strike conviction into her heart. Amen. She said, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. God kept dealing with her heart. Jesus not only dined with sinners, I want to say that Jesus took the time to deal with sinners. That is, he would just take precious time away from what people might call the ministry and uh, meet the need of some wicked person. An example is in Luke chapter 7, verse 37, where the Bible says, Behold a woman in the city which was a sinner. And generally in the context of the, of the Gospels, when it's talking about someone a sinner, we know that all is sin. It's usually talking about somebody that was guilty of some outward sin that people knew about. This woman was, uh, that woman in John chapter 4, the one at the well, I guarantee you people knew she was wicked. And when she came to realize who the Lord was, believe on the Lord, she went throughout the city, and the Bible says she told all the men who that was. I'm telling you, that woman, she knew all the men in town. Amen. And she'd been married five times, and now she's shacked up with a guy she wasn't married to, and, and she came to know the Lord. Amen. Hey, folks, it doesn't matter where you've been. If you're willing to come to God on God's terms, the Lord take time with you. Amen. Jesus dealt with sinners. About this woman, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat and meet in the Pharisee's house, she... She brought an alabaster box of ointment. Y'all remember that story? Amen. And stood at his feet before him, weeping. Mm -hmm. And began to wash his feet with tears. And did wipe them with the hairs of her head. And kissed his feet. And anointed them with the ointment. Amen. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is. That toucheth him, for she is a sinner. The Lord Jesus Christ spent time with sinners. He confronted them personally. He communicated with them. And he took some... Now, the reason why some of these people were wicked is they were full of the devil. Right. You understand that, right? You folks, you folks really understand? I mean, you people, you watch all kinds of stuff on TV. Certainly you understand there's a real devil, don't you? Of course. <laughs> I mean... Don't get to where you think all of that spirit stuff is just stuff that's made up and done on computers. There's a spirit in you if you're unsaved. If you're saved and you're living with somebody that's unsaved, there's a spirit in them. And it's not the Holy Ghost. It's not the Holy Spirit. Don't be surprised when something comes up unexpectedly in their temperament and in their temper and in their tongue. And you wonder, what have I done to deserve this? Maybe nothing. But if you belong to the Lord, the devil hates you. Right. Amen. Amen. The Lord loves the person who's captivated by the devil. But I'm telling you, the devil does not like people who are captivated by the Lord. Right. He is not your friend. And his children, that is people who are unsaved, Jesus said in John 8, 44, you're of your father the devil. And the lust your father you will do. If you have problems with unsaved people that you work with, don't be surprised. Yeah. Their spiritual father uses them to bother you. Yeah. Amen. 
their spiritual father uses them to attack you. But Jesus, he goes after those people because he knows they're in bondage. He knows that they're in trouble. And he is the one who is the physician who can solve the problem, solve the case that they have. Third thing we'll say is, besides that Jesus died with sinners, Jesus dealt with sinners. Number three, Jesus desired sinners. Yes. He says, preacher, I know something about one of your members. Yeah. Well, God knows some things about you that nobody's told me yet. Right. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And you know what? Jesus knows all about you. Amen. And if you'll come to him, he'll use you anyway. Amen. He wants you to be saved. You've got to come to him in faith. First of all, trust Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross of Calvary to get you to heaven. You've got to trust in his shed blood to get you to heaven. But once you're saved, it don't matter. Excuse me for my grammar. It ain't, it ain't any difference what you've been. It's what you is now. Are you born again? Are you a child of God now? Then live like it. Be thankful that the Lord who dealt with sinners has desired sinners to come to it. He said in verse 13, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Amen. Jesus left heaven to reach them. He left the splendors of glory to come to this wicked place called earth. Filled with wicked people all over it, knowing that they were going to abuse him, knowing that they were going to refuse him, knowing that they were going to lie about him, knowing that some of them were going to ignore him, knowing that they were going to crucify him, he came anyway yeah. Amen. to die on the cross for sinners. He left heaven to reach sinners. He lived to reach sinners. He looks for sinners today Amen. who will accept him in, in the sense of trusting what he did when he laid down his life for sin on the cross of Calvary. Look and live, my brother, live. You look in faith to the one who died for your sins on the cross of Calvary, God will give you everlasting life. Amen. I'm saying Jesus, number four, died for sinners. Perhaps every woman in here has at some time in your life kind of fantasized about some dashing man of a man being willing to give his life for you. Standing in the way, taking the bullet, the sword, depending on your fantasy, the dragon, okay. Whatever it might have been that was after you. Does any of y'all still have dreams about stuff like that? And every man probably at some time in his life has thought about being, being able to save some damsel in distress. Even if it required giving up his own life to be able to stand there and rescue her. And, and we all enjoy those stories. But you know what the Bible says about Jesus dying for you and me? It says, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. But yet for adventure, for a righteous man, some would even dare to die. But the next verse, Romans 5, 8 says, but God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us, Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Jesus died voluntarily for sinners. I knew that Jesus died long before I got saved. I know why he died. He died because he chose to. The Mormons want to say that Joseph Smith died like Jesus, you know, at the hands of an angry mob. But the fact is that, that um, the founder of the Mormon church died in jail, guns blazing. Somehow he, he got a gun. That's right. And he was trying to shoot his way out of there. And it all had to do with him, him uh, having destroyed a man's printing press who found out that Joe Smith liked women. And I'm not talking about that he was heterosexual. I'm talking about he liked women, plural. Right. Yeah. Amen. That's how the church started. Right. He liked women, plural. And uh, he liked to have a bunch of women. Amen. Word got out and somebody printed it up about him. And so Joseph Smith sent some guys over to destroy his press. He ended up getting put in jail. That's right. Yeah. And before they, before they killed him, word got out that some of the people co coming after him, probably some of them husbands, <laughs> coming after him, somebody got a gun to it. 
So, but when Jesus died, Jesus could have. He said, "He said I can uh, call my Father and Him send twelve legions of angels." We got a place in the Old Testament where the Bible tells us that one angel killed something like 185,000 men in one night. Twelve legions of angels. Don't you imagine they could have got him down from the cross? I truly believe so. You know why Jesus died on the cross? Because he wanted to. To save your soul. But God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. He died voluntarily for sinners. He died vicariously for sinners. What's that mean? That means he took your place. Amen. That means he hung there in your stead. Amen. That means Christ died for us. Christ died for our sins. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yes. It may have looked like defeat, but it was victory. Amen. He died voluntarily. He died vicariously. And he died victorious. Amen. For sinners. Hanging up there between earth and heaven, he defeated the devil in his own territory. I'm talking about the prince of the powers of the air. Jesus hung there and bore your sins and mine on the cross of Calvary. Dying victoriously. And through his sacrifice on the cross of Calvary, followed up by his burial, three days later rising from the dead, that is how the Lord delivers sinners today. I'm telling you that the gospel message is not you turn around and do better. The gospel message is not you plead for God's mercy. The gospel message is not you walk this aisle or you repeat after me, or you get baptized in our Baptist church, the gospel message is this. Christ died for sinners. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Amen. That's the gospel that Paul declared according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. And when a person believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, he's trusting that Jesus died for his sins and that God is satisfied with that and it's up to you as to whether you're going to trust what Christ did or you're going to trust what you do. You say, well, here's how I know I'm going to heaven. I did this, I did that, I did this and the other thing. Here's what I did to go to heaven. Nothing. Jesus paid it all. I trusted in him who did the work. Yes, I believe I'm saved by works, but not the works of Michael O'Neill. Yeah. I'm saved by the works of Jesus Christ. Amen. And his shed blood on the cross of Calvary for me. That's how sinners come to Jesus. Amen. Is in faith. I give you that verse again. It's 1 Timothy 1.15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save Sinners, Amen. of whom I am chief. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.15. Who's the chief of sinners? Anybody except that is for yourself. Matter of fact, I believe that when you get under what we've had, it's called Holy Ghost conviction, where the Holy Spirit, as Jesus promised, reproves you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. I believe you pretty much are just occupied with how wicked you are. When you are resisting and rebelling against that, then you think of Jimmy Swagger. Some of y'all remember him. Amen. And you think, well, at least I'm not as bad as him. <laughs> or you think of some other preacher you know in this town that you can find fault with. You say, at least I'm not as bad as him. When you're under Holy Ghost conviction and you're about to get saved, it's because the Holy Spirit has gotten you convinced Amen. that if any, there's anybody that deserves to go to hell, it's you. Amen. That's right. When I got saved, I had been... For the last week or so, I had been the most miserable teenage boy in the world, as far as I could tell. I didn't know how to get relief from my misery. Until on a Sunday morning, the preacher preached. And for the first time in my life, I understood that Jesus died for me. Amen. Amen. 
He paid for my sins with his own blood. Yes. 2,000 years before I ever committed a single one of those sins, all of my sins were laid on Jesus Christ. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. The comparison is, Look, my brother, live. Look to Jesus now and live. Look in faith and believing on Jesus Christ is the look that has saved you. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? If you're a lost sinner,